Lecture 1-2, A Journey of Choices. In the first part of this lecture, we developed economic reasoning propositions 1 and 2 within the context of personal decision making, introducing you to a graphic that helps to lay out the steps of opportunity cost analysis. In part 2, we'll use that economic reasoning tool to look at the choices made by the early Soviet leaders who came to power in the Bolshevik Revolution. To review, remember that we have to ask ourselves a series of questions. First and foremost is, who's the decision maker? Once we focus on who is making the choices, we can marshal all our skills in historical investigation to answer the key questions in opportunity cost analysis. What alternatives did the decision maker face? And remember, this is a question of perception. It's not you and me, with all the resources of historical hindsight, identifying the alternatives. We have to get out the journals and diaries and interviews and speeches and figure out what the decision maker perceived to be the alternatives. Then, what did the decision maker perceive to be the benefits of each alternative? And how did he value those benefits? Once we've answered this question, we know why the decision maker chose the alternative he did and why he was willing to bear the opportunity cost, the foregone benefits of the alternative he refused. Now, like the 1,000 years of czars, like Nicholas and like Kerensky before them, the Bolsheviks faced scarcity a reality that was starkly apparent in an underdeveloped country that had been ravaged by internal and external warfare. Lenin immediately and continually had to make choices about production and consumption in order to answer the three basic economic questions, what to produce, how to produce it, and for whom to produce it. In order to understand how Lenin weighed the various benefits of alternative uses of resources, it's instructive to look at the ideas that he brought to leadership. He had long been a dissident, and his opposition to the Tsars and experiences in Western Europe drew him to Karl Marx and Frederick Engels' utopian vision of a communist state. To summarize briefly, Marx's philosophy grew out of his reaction to the distribution of wealth he observed during the rapid industrial growth in Europe. He believed that only labor produced value, and thus output rightly belonged to the workers who had produced it. In his labor theory of value, the owners of the machinery and factory, the capitalists as he called them, were usurpers, getting rich by stealing the value created by workers. Marx predicted that the gap between rich and poor would widen as the capitalist wealth continued to grow faster than workers' incomes. And in that gap, capitalism would sow the seeds of its own destruction. The workers would rise up and forcefully take back the wealth they had created, instituting a communist state in which the workers controlled production and shared the output. Lenin was a bright student, but he was also observant and he brought his own experiences to his reading of Marx. Living in exile in Western Europe, he was struck not only by the skewed distribution of wealth that had bothered Marx, but also by the level of wealth that industrialization provided, a level that agrarian Russia couldn't achieve, he believed, just by redistributing the Tsar's fast holdings. Industrialization was the only way to produce more wealth. Now, Marx predicted that the communist revolution would occur after the transformation from agriculture to industry. He saw the revolution coming from the bottom up in industrialized, advanced capitalist economies. Russia was only just beginning to industrialize. It clearly didn't fit Marx's model. But Lenin saw no need to wait for capitalist development to breed proletarian revolt. Instead, he determined to use communist organization of production to transform Russia from an agrarian to an industrialized nation. In Lenin's model, communism would be imposed from the top rather than rising spontaneously from an impressed industrial working class. He would lead an impoverished Russia into wealth 
and then go on to transform the world. Taking this background into our opportunity cost analysis, we know that Lenin, our decision maker, perceives and evaluates his alternatives in light of two goals. First, to consolidate power and to secure the nation by building a strong military. Then, and indispensable to the first goal, is to promote rapid economic development by emphasizing heavy industry that would create the foundation for future growth. In pursuit of these goals, he took control of the economy, quickly nationalizing most sectors, with the notable exception of agriculture, where he used redistribution of farmland to try to buy the loyalty of individual farmers to the new regime. He focused on increasing the pace of industrialization by taking over the allocation of resources and by setting prices and controlling all foreign trade in agricultural goods. One result of choosing to emphasize industrial production and military police strength was that the Bolsheviks did consolidate their power. The opportunity cost of diverting resources from agriculture was borne largely by the peasantry food shortages and the inability to move resources continued to plague the country, in part because rail lines and roads had been destroyed during the war and the revolution. Agricultural production fell significantly, as did the availability of non-agricultural goods. If we return to our three-legged stool analogy, however, we find that the moral cultural leg of the stool remained surprisingly strong throughout the Leninist period. Now, one reason is clearly that the growing strength of military and police power increased the cost of opposition, breeding fear and unwillingness to resist coercion. But there are other reasons found within the culture and background of the Russian people. Their thousand year history of Tsarist rule shaped their perception of the alternative to communism, and it wasn't a particularly attractive alternative. In a sense, they were used to living with little. Poverty is poverty, whether under Lenin or under Nicholas. And at least under the communists, there was a glimmer of hope for the future, both in Lenin's rhetoric and in the progress they could see around them. For example, Lenin's sojourn in Western Europe had convinced him of the value of electrification as a first step in creating wealth, and he'd carried that conviction with him in setting priorities for the industrialization of Russia. So one of the first visible evidences of progress was the electrification of cities and factories. While the peasants' own lives may not have changed much, under Lenin they could see progress being made. And Lenin was a master propagandist. He encouraged them to believe that industrial growth today meant better lives for them in the future. He sent out propaganda trains, for example, to show movies of the great strides being made. Lenin's rhetoric, forecasting the triumphant spread of communist ideas, also fed traditional Russian dreams of empire. In combination, these factors add up to a strong buy-in to the goals and promises of the Soviets, and they help to explain the willingness of citizens to bear the burden of the opportunity cost imposed on them by Lenin's choices. So, if we generalize, the Leninist period and the choice to emphasize industrial production over agriculture and other consumer production is a period in which the strong political, legal, and moral cultural legs in effect compensated for the ongoing weaknesses in the economic leg, weaknesses that in fact grew worse. The economy performed so badly that eventually Lenin chose to reverse the full nationalization he had earlier instituted. In 1921, he introduced the new economic policy, which had its greatest impact in agriculture it eliminated the requirement that all agricultural production be turned over to the state. Instead, peasants were taxed. That is, they were required to turn over a percentage of their output to the state, but they were allowed to market the remainder themselves. This was clearly a retreat in the face of failure, but Lenin justified it 
as a temporary new type of capitalism that was designed to create a necessary first step to communism. He noted that we are taking one step backward in order to take two steps forward. And the bottom line is that the policy worked. Agricultural production quickly increased, and by 1928 it had recovered to pre-war levels. The NEP retreat from communism was not instituted in the Soviet Union without controversy. After Lenin's death in 1924, Joseph Stalin eventually emerged atop the Soviet leadership structure, having outmaneuvered his chief rival, Leon Trotsky, who had been Lenin's other close aide and the expected successor. Although Stalin had supported the NEP when Lenin was alive, he came to side with those in the party who saw it as an abandonment of communist principles and a threat to Soviet strength in the event of another war. Stalin's priorities were always very much influenced by the changes he'd observed in World War I, when the machinery of war evolved from wagons and horses to motorized vehicles and planes. And he knew that the security of the Soviet Union and the power of the Communist Party rested on being able to meet that standard. Additionally, he was not convinced that the Great War had indeed succeeded as the war to end all wars. And he believed that the Soviet Union had to be ready for the next conflict. And to do that, it had to rapidly industrialize to the level of the West. So Stalin determined to finance this effort with the fully recovered burgeoning agricultural sector, which meant ending the NEP. Stalin's perception of the opportunity cost of diverting resources from agriculture to heavy industrial production is captured in his comment that, quote, either we do it or we shall be crushed. In 1928, he replaced the NEP with agricultural collectivization as part of the five-year plan. Farm output was purchased by the government at the artificially low state price and sold in the cities or exported abroad at higher prices to fund industrialization and military buildup. Stalin's five-year plan was successful both in terms of his goals of industrialization and military buildup but also in terms of the moral cultural leg in our stool analogy. The five-year plan extended Lenin's promise for the future with observable, measurable criteria. And during the period of 1928 to 1933, the evidence of progress became increasingly visible. Large cities had electricity. Factories sprang up and people were moved to the cities to work. Whole new towns were built for the purpose of supplying the factories with coal, steel, and other raw materials. At a time when the rest of the world was slipping into a catastrophic depression, the Soviet economy posted notable growth statistics, 48% by the end of the plan in 1933. That's amazing, an almost 10% annual growth rate. Producer goods output grew by 113%, electrical generation by 227%. At the same time, however, note that the choices about resource allocation imposed a cost. Consumer goods production grew by only 1%, and that's probably most accurately conceived of as a small increase in food supplies rather than any other type of consumer good. And note, livestock production actually fell by 8%. The bottom line? Well, life wasn't worse, and there seemed to be reason for hope. Both contributed to strong support for the regime. Equally important, however, was the high and rising cost of opposition to Stalin. His reputation as a ruthless totalitarian ruler was both growing and deserved. In 1932, he used the secret police and military to crush resistance to collectivization by Ukrainian landowners, the Kulaks. Sealing off this breadbasket from the rest of the country, he ordered the confiscation of all livestock and crops. Death squads executed literally millions of people, some reports indicating a quota of 10,000 executions per week. Famine ensued during the bitter cold winter of 1932-33, 
and the daily death count from starvation or execution rose to 25,000. Estimates of the final toll range from 5 to 12 million, with another 2 to 3 million being marched to the gulags. No one, it seemed, was beyond Stalin's reach. High-ranking officers were executed for small or fabricated lapses, and ordinary citizens disappeared forever into the back seats and trunks of the infamous Black Ravens, the cars of the secret police that appeared in the night. The culture of fear and suspicion, whether an outgrowth of Stalin's paranoia or a brilliant strategy to dampen dissent, was certainly a major source of the strength of both the political and moral cultural legs during the Stalin years. Support also came from the reality that the Soviet Union began to make its presence felt on the world stage. As Hitler's strength grew in Germany and the sabers of war began rattling throughout Europe, Stalin felt confirmed in his ongoing emphasis on heavy industry and industrial production. But he also knew that his army was not yet fully prepared to protect the Soviet Union from Hitler's forces. He faced a momentous decision. And again, we can use opportunity cost analysis to understand his choice in the international arena, just as we used it to analyze his choice in domestic policy. While Stalin could have conceivably chosen to deal with neither the Nazis nor the Western powers and tried to keep the USSR out of the war, he apparently didn't consider that one of his best alternatives. So, in the late 1930s, he was simultaneously engaged in negotiations with Britain and France, known as the Tripartite Talks, and with Hitler's foreign minister, Ribbentrop. So, if we use our opportunity at cost analysis grid with Stalin as the decision maker, we can see that the considered alternatives are an agreement with the Nazis or an agreement with Britain and France, the countries that would become the allies in World War II. Using opportunity cost analysis here helps us avoid a common misperception about Stalin that arises from knowing the ultimate outcome of his choice. Remember the warnings in part one of this lecture to be careful about confusing opportunity cost and consequence and about the forward-looking orientation of economics as compared to the backward-looking orientation of history? Well, it's clearly in play here because everybody knows that the Nazis eventually violated the non-aggression pact and invaded Russia. With that knowledge of outcomes or consequences, notice I did not say cost, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that Stalin made a poor decision, or, as my sophomore history students often said, that Stalin was dumb. Using opportunity cost analysis forces us to step back into his shoes, to consider the decision from his point of view. And if you subscribe to the position that Stalin was dumb, this analysis should reframe your conclusion to, Stalin was dumb, all right dumb like a fox. Let's lay out the benefit of the alternatives. Forgive me again for oversimplifying these, but you can read more about it in the lesson outline, and I suspect many of you know a great deal about this anyway. But first and foremost, signing the non-aggression pact would buy Stalin time. Time to continue building his army. No, he didn't just stop, sit back and say, oh, no need to build the army now. I'm buddies with Adolf. No, instead, there's absolutely no indication in the record that Stalin thought the pact made the USSR immune to Nazi invasion, only that it kept his enemy close, as the old saying goes. And remember that continuing the military buildup depended on the income from agriculture, so time was valuable, too, in getting another harvest in the valuable breadbasket region that always suffered first from invasion. The second big benefit was that the secret portions of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement fed that old Russian and new communist desire for empire. All the brownish regions on the map on the screen were to become part of the Soviet sphere of influence. Not bad. Not bad at all from Stalin's perspective. 
Now, depending on the depth of our analysis, we could add some other benefits. Access to Nazi intelligence and technology, for example. But in any case, you can see that there were great benefits to signing the pact. What about that other alternative, working with the Allies? It's harder to find things to fill into this benefits box. True, there's no love lost between the Nazis and the Communists. Maybe there's some minimal satisfaction in snubbing them. But Stalin's already shown himself to be more concerned with practical kinds of measures. And yes, there were some trade agreements being included in the tripartite talks. But more importantly, Britain and France were being really balky about allowing the Russians to march through Poland should a war break out. So from Stalin's point of view, there's really not much here, is there? Another thing I want to point out is that filling out this box reminds us that the United States doesn't figure in this decision. And it's not accurate to read them back into the analysis. My sophomores, well, at least the ones who actually read the assignment, always got stuck on the fact that eventually the U.S. entered and won World War II. So in their minds, the Allies includes the U.S., even if I wrote Britain and France only in capital letters. And in their minds, who wouldn't want to be on the winner's side and give up an agreement with sneaky Hitler, who was going to double-cross you anyway? Framing the decision as Stalin would have demolishes this kind of sophomore interpretation of history. The opportunity cost analysis makes it hard not to see that the perceived benefits of signing the non-aggression pact far outweighed the cost. Giving up working with Britain and France doesn't seem like giving up much, especially in comparison to the chance to gain Poland. So, Stalin signed the non-aggression pact and he helped invade Poland in September 1939. In June 1941, Hitler violated the pact and invaded the Soviet Union. To make a long and bloody story extremely short, from the Soviet point of view, Stalin's decision was vindicated because the USSR emerged victorious from World War II. The Soviet perspective was that they won World War II for themselves and for the world when the German forces floundered in the Russian snow. The price in lives was high. Estimates ranged to 20 million Soviet soldiers and civilians dead. In terms of Stalin's goals, however, and in terms of the three-legged stool and the institutional strength of the Soviet Union, the payoff was well worth it. Belief in the communist system by citizens of the USSR was at an all-time high following World War II. Not only did the Soviet Union emerge victorious, it emerged a world leader, Stalin sitting front and center on the world stage with Roosevelt and Churchill. In the division of territories after the war, the Soviet Union realized the age-old vision and communist goal of empire, and that, too, added strength to the moral cultural leg of the stool. So, to recap, what we've done in this lecture is to apply the economic way of thinking to historical inquiry. Instead of looking at decisions from the point of view of their outcomes and consequences, we forced ourselves to metaphorically step back into Lenin's and Stalin's shoes to see the choices they faced as they would have had to see them without knowledge of the outcomes. And suddenly, the decision makers become more real than old photos and pages in textbooks that detail the consequences of their choices. Opportunity cost analysis is easily applicable to any number of historical decisions, yet we seldom take advantage of its ability to make history come alive. With perhaps the exception of President Harry Truman's decision about dropping the atomic bomb on Japan, this tool of economic reasoning is missing from traditional texts and classroom history materials. But as we've demonstrated here, Opportunity cost analysis is a relatively easy addition to the study of history shaping decisions when we can identify the decision maker and when we have access to historical sources telling us about his values and perceptions. Examples from American history abound, from 
President Jefferson's decision to buy Louisiana, to President Lincoln's decision to free the slaves in the states in rebellion, to President Kennedy's decision to blockade Cuba, to President Reagan's choice to label the Soviet Union an evil empire. As you read the curriculum materials, you'll find additional examples of opportunity cost analysis of decisions made during the Leninist, Stalinist era of Soviet history. And they can serve as a guide for writing examples that fit your own curriculum. Before we leave this topic, I want to briefly take us up to the end of the Stalinist era in Soviet history. Again, with apologies for the overly generalized approach. We find that Stalin's post-war choices continued to reflect his priority, power. Power for himself and the Communist Party in the empire and for the Soviet Union in the world. The Soviet empire, as we came to think of it during the Cold War, took shape in the settlement of World War II. Stalin regained control over territory lost in World War I and over a number of other Eastern European countries. These weren't voluntary annexations, and maintaining control of the satellite countries required continual deployment of men and military equipment, meaning the ongoing choice to bear the opportunity cost of allocating resources to that effort. As in World War I, Stalin's experience in World War II reinforced his belief that the Soviet Union had to keep pace with the military strength of the West. He'd seen war change once again this time from tanks and planes to missiles and atomic bombs. Stalin believed that the future security of the USSR depended on keeping pace, which meant bringing the Soviet Union into the atomic age. He did this in part by acquiring, through a variety of methods, German technology and German scientists after the war. And, in fact, it wasn't long before the Soviets were conducting their own nuclear tests. Stalin was nothing if not forward-thinking, however, and he knew that he had to create his own researchers and inventors. The German scientists weren't going to live forever, and the literacy rate in the Soviet Union was below 10%. So he also chose after the war to invest heavily in education, both universal education for children and, more importantly, higher and technical education designed to ensure that the Soviet Union would keep pace with the West in the technology of war. As we'll see in later lessons, this choice had long-term consequences, some anticipated, some not, but they would figure in the events leading up to the demise of the Soviet Union in 1991. So, we'll stop here. Noting that Stalin died in 1953, a hero in the Soviet Union and an imposing figure on the world stage. As the USSR entered the 50s, communist power was secure and the empire was poised for a period of significant economic growth. In Lesson 2, we'll consider the mechanism of economic growth in this centrally directed economy and look at the task of the production ministers who had to direct the allocation of resources and output without the information and coordination that would have been provided by markets.